Hello and welcome back. In today's video on social psychology, we're going to be diving into how groups can change our attitude and behavior. We're going to be looking at a variety of techniques that we can use to persuade or change a person's opinion on things and how group dynamics influence the way people think and act as a whole. So let's go ahead and get started. Social psychology can be used in a variety of circumstances, including things like advertising and marketing. How do we get someone to buy our product, join our campaign, get on board with whatever it is we are trying to promote or sell? There are a variety of psychological techniques that we can see utilized in our day-to-day -day lives that are used to persuade or change our attitudes. One of the first techniques that we can use is something that is known as the foot in the door phenomenon. Its name is reminiscent of old door to door salesmen who just needed to get their foot in the door in order to make their sale. The idea behind the foot in the door technique is to start with something small, something that seems very reasonable in order to build up to a larger request. It could be something as simple as putting your email address down for a website for a discount that then follows up with additional promotions and emails to get you to keep coming back to that site. Sometimes we see it used in joining memberships or clubs where it starts with no money down and the bigger request to pay comes later. The idea with foot in the door is to start with something that seems very simple and reasonable in order to build up to what a person really wants. And we see this used in marketing on a regular basis. Something else we can do to try and persuade someone is tap into what's known as cognitive dissonance. And this is what happens when our attitude and behavior does not match up. It could be, for example, asking someone to sign a pledge to not text and drive. Then the next time someone goes to pick up their phone, the idea is to plant that dissonance in their mind, that guilt that they feel that their attitude of texting and driving is bad does not line up with their behavior where they're actually texting while driving. To create that dissonance, something has to change. Either the person has to convince themselves and believe that texting and driving is okay, or they have to change their behavior and put their phone down. So the goal here is to hopefully change their behavior, try and get them to put their phones down while driving to stop texting while driving. Another persuasion technique that can be used is known as the elaboration likelihood model. And this taps into how do we convince someone that our product is good and worth buying. There are two different routes of persuasion that a person could use. The central route, which is what uses facts and logic and spells out exactly why our product is great and why you would want to purchase it. The other route would be the peripheral route to persuasion. And this focuses more on the appeal. Think about how celebrities are often used to endorse product or how commercials sometimes don't talk that much about the product itself but tries to evoke a specific emotion or feeling that makes us have that positive reaction to the product. Using the peripheral route is often a successful way to convince someone to purchase a product. Other persuasion techniques that are also highly effective are the self-perception theory, which is similar to cognitive dissonance, but the big difference is we start with someone who doesn't have a strong opinion either way. Cognitive dissonance is meant to tap into changing your attitude. Self-perception is trying to catch someone early before they form an opinion. So cognitive dissonance might be really useful if we're talking about two competing sandwich companies and one you already purchase a lot. How can we get you to change your attitude, change your behavior so that you go to the other sandwich company instead? Self-perception is more useful for something that you haven't really established an opinion on yet. Let's say, for example, toothpaste companies. Maybe you don't have a strong opinion about it, but you see a commercial that makes you laugh, that taps into that peripheral route, and your attitude towards it is positive. 
that might get you on board with that specific company before a different company even has the opportunity to come in to try to change your mind. So self-perception is really about getting that initial opinion, whereas cognitive dissonance is more about changing your opinion or behavior. And then finally, we have the mere exposure effect that tells us that the more we see something, the more likely we are to favor it. This helps us to understand why people are more likely to pay more for, say, name brand cookies than they are for the exact same generic brand. Because they've seen it so often, they're more familiar with it. When given the choice between something familiar and something unfamiliar, we're more likely to go with what is familiar to us. And last but not least, we can also use the conditioning or the learning perspective to convince someone to buy into a product or to become a lifelong customer. Think about things like punch cards for specific shops or other loyalty programs that reward you for continuous shopping there. Those rewards are reinforcing or shaping your behavior to encourage you to continue shopping at that same location. So you can see how social psychology and psychological concepts in general can be used to alter our behavior on a day-to-day -day basis. One final term that is one of my favorites is the opposite of foot in the door, which is known as door in the face. This technique starts with asking for an outrageous request, something you know they'll say no to, and it's like slamming the door shut with the answer no. And then just kind of opening the door back up a little bit again to request what you really want. So starting with something that's, that's unreasonable makes that second request seem much more reasonable and makes someone more likely to actually agree to it. And our final topic today is going to be on group dynamics, looking at how groups influence our behavior on a regular basis. We spend a lot of time in our lives in groups whether it is in school or socially. And so it's important that we understand how groups can have an influence on individual thought process and behavior. One way that groups might influence our behavior is through a concept that is known as de-individuation, which is essentially the loss of individuality. When we're in a group and say emotions are running high, we are feeling anonymous, we might do things that we normally wouldn't do. Think about mob-like behavior or riots where a person would engage in behaviors that they normally wouldn't. We even see this in more innocent situations such as school dances. When the lights are off and we're in a large crowd, we might dance in a way that we normally wouldn't if the lights were on and we were the only person standing there. Being in groups can help foster that sense of anonymity that can change the way that we behave and act. We can even take this further and take a look at loss of individuality that we see on the internet. Hiding behind a computer screen and typing comments, especially on platforms where we can hide our identity as well, can often lead to people saying things to others that they probably wouldn't say to them in their day-to-day -day lives. So we can see de-individuation show up in a variety of circumstances in our society all the time. And so groups can really help or hurt when it comes to how they influence an individual's behavior. Sometimes groups can help, such as in social facilitation, where groups help facilitate a person's performance, for example. This could be in the case of a runner who hits a PR at a track meet versus in practice, or it could be a musician who performs their best in front of crowds versus practicing alone. Sometimes groups can actually help enhance a person's ability to perform, specifically if it's on either a simple or a well-learned task. It can sort of encourage a person to perform at their best. Now, if the task is not simple, if it's quite complex, and if it's not well-learned, if we're still figuring it out, then those groups can actually make us more nervous and that can hinder our performance. But if it's something simple or well-learned, social facilitation can actually help increase a person's ability to perform in front of others. But groups can also hurt as well. We see this often in things like group projects where social loafing comes into play. 
where when we are asked to do something as a group, we put forth less effort than we do if we were to work on it individually. And sometimes we have major social loafers in group projects where one person has to do just about everything because the other group members don't do enough. And so groups can also be detrimental in that regard because the amount of effort that people put in decreases significantly. And when it comes to group projects for school, we all know we hate when that happens. Finally, the other ways that groups can influence a person's behavior or thought process is also through concepts like group polarization. This happens when like-minded individuals come together to discuss issues that they agree upon. Studies have found that when people spend more time talking to those that they agree with, they'll walk away from that conversation feeling even stronger about their opinions than they did when the conversation initially started. This is something that we can see in political polarization in our society today, especially in the way that people interact again on the internet. If we only look for and discuss and interact with people who already agree with us, we are often going to reinforce our beliefs instead of considering things from a different perspective. And that is going to cause our beliefs to become further and further apart from the other group. This is a phenomenon that is ever present in our society today. And then finally, we have what's known as group think. And this is what happens when a group seems to be in consensus, and as a result, nobody offers up alternatives. It's essentially desire for harmony in a group that leads to poor decision making. If everybody thinks that everybody else is in agreement, even if three, four, five members of a group have a different idea, because they think that everybody else is in agreement, everybody keeps their mouth shut. And as a result, they might miss out on opportunities to offer up alternate viewpoints or different solutions to sometimes major problems. So this is something we should be aware of as well. So you can see that there are a lot of ways that groups can influence our behavior. We can use these techniques to persuade someone or change their attitude. And we can also see how groups affect the way we think and act in school, in our social environments, and even on the internet. Next time we come together, we're going to take a look at prejudice and discrimination and try and understand from a social psychology standpoint how those come to be as well. Thank you so much for watching, and as always remember, be kind to your mind.